Hey everyone, welcome back to OTD Military History. Today we are covering new ground for this channel. Never covered this particular theater, I think at all, or this operation. So today we're gonna to be looking at the quote unquote forgotten army group of Operation Barbarossa. So if anyone hasn't been to this channel before, uh, my name is Brad St. I have a PhD in military history and cover all kinds of topics here. Uh, my personal experience, academic-wise, is Second World War, First World War, so it tends to be 20th century based, so this is perfect today. So a new guest on the channel, um, again, covering something I never covered before uh, with Grant Harwood, Harwood Ward. Sorry, I can't talk after a second. <laughs> uh, looking at this Forgotten Army group, and I don't want to mispronounce the name, so I'm going to let Grant handle that as we bring him in. Hey, hey, hey how you doing? Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it and uh, kind of helping me break some new ground here. Yeah, I'm excited. Always uh, always uh, glad to get word out there about the Romanian contribution in uh, World War II. And I think it's really overlooked. Um, forgotten maybe is, uh, you know, kind of over, over, you gotta, over you know, exaggerating things a little bit. But you got to uh, pump that up for the audience, you know. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I think our army group Antonescu is, uh, I think, a really important aspect of the, of the initial invasion that no one really thinks about. Or if, if when people are writing about the invasion, it kind of gets sidelined and kind of oftentimes just basically kind of, you know, they have other better things to write about. It doesn't get a mention. Right. And I mean, we'll get into it uh, and kind of we were talking before about the that southern flank and everything and when I don't know that well. Um, but as I like to always ask people when they especially come on for the first time is why this topic? Why are you interested in particularly Romania in the Second World War? Uh, well, if I have no like personal connections, no family connections to Romania, I, I really didn't know anything about the country. Um, I always had a love for World War II um, my whole life. My grandfather served in the Navy before the war, actually, so not, uh, in the 1930s. Yeah. He was on an aircraft carrier, the, the USS Lexington. Um, nice. I actually looked for Amelia Earhart uh, when she nice. went missing in the Pacific. He was on the ship at that time. And so he was felt connected to the ship. And, you know, he would tell me about, he had a book about when it got sunk in the Battle of Coral Sea. Mm -hmm. And so that and other reasons, you know, history has always been my interest. World War II has always been my interest. But my interest in Romania didn't, it wasn't until I turned 19. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, or you know Mormons, and so they called me on my mission to Romania. That's where I was assigned, and that was kind of first time Romania really entered into my you know kind of my world. You know, before then, I don't think I knew anything about it. Even Dracula, you know, Dracula was part of Transylvania. <laughs> like I didn't really even have an idea where like Transylvania was. You know, like right. it exists as like a place in an actual country. Um, but I, I lived there uh, I, for two years as a missionary, I learned the language, and when I came back, it just made a lot of sense to take my World War II love and my new love for Romania and its history, put them together, and and then you know I also found out that almost nothing's been written on it in English, yeah. um, so I could write pretty much on anything I wanted. So it's kind of taken me down that path for me to work on Romania World War II. It's been a lot of fun and really exciting and and cool to be able to get out and get this information out there. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I, I, I'm i sure I'm not the only one, because uh, you've been on uh, World War II TV with Woody a bunch. I'm not the only one who's going to appreciate this, because as, again, it's discussed a lot, particularly in, in forums like this, the, the lack, outright lack of English language sources on some of these other theaters and fronts and, and countries that, you know, more or less get pushed to the back or the side, you don't get to hear much. So I'm glad you've taken that on. And I know that can be also an opportunity, but very challenging when there's nothing um, that's good and bad. But uh, anyway, so yeah, so thanks for doing that. Uh, it's appreciated by me, especially um, as someone who loves to get into things that are not as much as popular as others. So so this 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 army group, um, not, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know too, too much <laughs> about it or Kind of understand how it comes to be. I mean, Romania is an interesting one to me just because, and I take everything in the context of the First World War as well, right? They're on the Allied side, not so much in the second. Yeah, I think it's there's an it's an important context of Eastern Europe, and you know, Romania joins the Allies in the First World War, but you also have you know Russia, 
you know, imperial Russia yeah. as an ally then, you know, which is replaced by um, the Soviet Union, right? And that changes things immensely. Um, so Romanians like to kind of overemphasize this connection to France and commitment to France. I mean, Romania is a monarchy, not a republic. Right. Right. I think that's one thing. It, it was ruled by a very cons like a conservative elite, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party. Uh, conservative Party falls apart after World War One, And so the Liberal kind of be party becomes the establishment, but it's a very conservative kind of liberalism. Like, uh, you know, yeah. and the kind of after World War One, they allow actual real there had been democracy, but like it hadn't been real to kind of democracy. And they give one man, one vote, more rights after World War I, which then, so the conservative party falls apart of the small elite of landowners and it gets replaced by all these far right populist groups. You have, mm. you know, Vlad the Impaler League is a really oh, one. one. Um, and um, eventually kind of, there's also like a peasant group, a national group, and the, they kind of join forces and it's wow. a populist national peasant party. Yeah. Right. And they can kind of pimp him. But then you have right wing, like Christian nationalists, the, uh, the League of, of Christian Defense. And it's basically, its platform is basically hate Jews because um, Jews are getting rights at this time as well because of of uh, the World War One. And so then you also have fascism, you know, the fascist legionary movement, the Legion of the Archangel Michael that develops, are also known as the Iron Guard. So by the yeah. 1930s, you know, you everything's going to the right, and you have a dictatorship get put in in 38. Right. Um, so really, like, there's, there, and that dictatorship, uh, which uh, is already under the king, it's a royal dictatorship under King Carol II, and since 1936, he's actually been pursuing what he calls a policy, policy of neutrality. So he's not saying like we are super hand in glove with the French and the British. He's actually kind of distancing himself in order to trade more with Nazi Germany. There's yeah. and get closer to them. There's like economic relations. So there's it's, it's a twisted path. But the idea that because the Romanians are Latin people and so they have a connection to France mm -hmm. is bogus. And oh, they speak French. Well, lots of people can speak French or like French cuisine. It doesn't make <laughs> them a Republican, liberal yeah. Democrat, you know, with those values, right? These yeah. the elites in Romania are more, especially in the military who, who take over, they're more like the Vichy French, you know, they're more like Pétain and those folks where they're kind of the the, the anti-Dreyfusards, you know, the anti-Semitic yeah. nationalists. Yeah. That's the kind of people. So the alliance with Nazi Germany isn't obvious, but when you start looking under the hood, yes, yeah, right, it makes more sense. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, connected threads there that uh, I think anyone can, can pull on who knows a little bit about the war and, and all that. I mean, you're saying all those things, and I'm like, you can just replace those for any country. A lot of the countries in, in continental Europe uh, listing those things off. They're not the only one. So I'm just going to pull up the PowerPoint here. So <laughs> All right. So, so, yeah, yeah, We'll get started here with Army Group Antonescu. Um, so that photo there is Antonescu is the one in the middle, the short one. Um, to his left, <laughs> is, or to our left, is uh, General Alexandru Ioannitsu, uh, who was his the chief of staff of the Romanian general staff. And then um, that's to the right is Eric Hansen, who is the chief of the German military mission to Romania. And these three are kind of coordinating a lot of the fighting at the beginning of, op of Operation Barbarossa in uh, the sector that Romania controls. And so just kind of a in in good, interesting image here of this Romanian-German uh, alliance that this is all going to be talking about. So we can move to the next slide. Um, so yeah, just kind of, it's important to remind people, I think it's e really easy when we think about the Eastern Front to think of it as a titanic clash between totalitarian yeah. giants, yeah. you know, the Nazism and communism, you know, Hitler and Stalin, the Germans and the Soviets, but, you know, and Soviets coded Russian, right? Where, but in yeah. reality, like the Soviet yeah. Union itself is this huge multicultural empire of, you know, Slavic groups, of, you know, of, other than Russians, of Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians. But then you also have, you know, Moldavians, Turkomans, you know, Kazakhs, Estonians, 
you know, all types of different type of people. But the thing is, it's also true on the on the German side, you know, that you have a lot of allied armies that get involved and kind of national contributions. And I kind of have them listed here. And if, yeah. I argue that Romania is kind of the most important. It provides two armies. Yeah. Italy, it also declares war on the very first day, joins in from the very first shots, which is unlike any of the others. Um, Italy declares war the same day, but they don't get troops in. And they send like about a corps, and it takes several months for them to get uh, involved. Finland, support it actually will commit like a big army and some corps. Yep. Uh, uh, more or as many, if maybe more than Romanians, but only temporarily. So Finland's the only other one that's as big. So, right. But they'll have these flanks, right? The northern flank and the southern flank, you know, with yep. Finland and Romania um, are kind of the two big ones. Um, but I, I still think that the Romanian contribution is, is, is uh, although Finland and the issue of like Leningrad is kind of a, a, another, it, where it's like, is this, could have this been war changing if Finland had pushed harder? Uh, but that's another topic for another show. Yeah, and then right. Hungary and Slovakia. Slovakia is kind of more of a client state, but yeah. um, they send corps. And eventually you get these other volunteer units. You know, Spain sends a division. Yeah. I've read an interesting history about that. And kind of, I'm putting it down in here because I think of it more, It the argument of the, of the historian was basically it's kind of more similar to these kind of uh, Waffen-SS volunteer units. Right. Uh, you know, VC France sends their legion, you know, because these are kind of, aren't just conscript armies, right? These aren't right. people that are kind of, you know, they're a bit more motivated. They've kind of been, you know, cold. You're finding some volunteers to one, to, to, to one degree or the other. But uh, yeah, I think it's important. And I think this often gets lost in these histories because, you know, you focus on the two big meanies, yeah. the Germans and um, the Soviets, but there's actually a lot of other people involved in this massive, massive um, campaign. You could really call it like several fronts, really. You know, it's like three fronts on one, mm. you know, yep. three or four fronts in, in one yep. area. You know, it's gigantic. Yeah, I think that's, sorry, just cut in real quick. I think that's a, a great thing to keep in mind, right, as we're, when we're moving forward here, that it's not one big homogenous, as it's seen in this map, <laughs> you know, this one big homogenous moving line, because that's not what it is, um, for just all kinds of reasons. So I like to think that in mind, because this has come up on other shows and scholarship and everything. It's it, it's important to remember, you know, local context matters. And, and that, so I think that's great you brought that up, Grant. Um, so we're going to focus, though, on Barbarossa's southern flank. And I thought, you know, kind of talk about why this is important yeah. um, just uh, for anybody here. And I think um, for Romania specifically, kind of the most always at the top of the list, more so than anything else. Um, and strategically, you know, it's the oil fields there. It, this is Romania produces something like 30 percent of access crude oil. Right. This is extremely important. Uh, resource, you know, for, you know, this is pretty much the only major oil fields that uh, Nazi Germany controls. There's some oil fields in Galicia, in, in which they don't, I don't, they actually don't, they don't control much of that right now. There's some in Hungary. Um, they have, you know, uh, they can create some out of, uh, they can create synthetic oil in some places. Right. That's an overarching effort by the Germans to try to overcome this. Um, but Romania is hugely important. So that's always kind of going to be like, we need Romania in our orbit economically, at least because of the oil. Um, and that's going to, when you're deciding to go against the Soviet Union, that's really problematic. I mean, the Soviet's border is right on, <laughs> and that means you're like a 30 minute flight, right? From, you know, because uh, the Soviets in 1940, important to point out, um, they have right. occupied part of Romania. This one in this map here, it took me a while to find it. This is the map right before the invasion. So Romania has lost uh, northern Bukovina and Bessarabia, um, which are these two provinces in the north and east um, that the Soviets um, occupied with the permission of the Germans uh, as part of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This was kind of part of the divvying up of, of uh, Europe into spheres of influence between the Nazis and the Soviets, at least temporarily. Um, but so... The Germans, you know, they allowed that, but they also got alarmed by that because they were expecting the Soviets just to take Bessarabia, but they also demanded northern Bukovina, which had not been mm. part. Bessarabia had been part of the Russian Empire, 
right. or the Bukovina had been part of Austria-Hungary. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so this is important that like the Soviets aren't just taking back Russian territory; they've actually expanded and taken more territory, kind of similar with you know, some other areas. It's like it's interesting here that the Soviets are using this opportunity to expand, not just regain territory they claim because it used to be part of the, the Russian Empire. Right. Um, but yeah, it means that means Romania is vulnerable. Your oil is vulnerable. I mean, one of the reasons why Hitler went into Greece and Yugoslavia mm -hmm. was to push the Brits out, make sure that they didn't have bomber bases to be able to hit Romanian oil, uh, you know, earlier in the year in April. <clears throat> um, and so then also importantly, why you need Romania is just as a base, um, especially when you're mm -hmm. looking at it with Hitler's perspective, right? We know that there's this kind of argument about Hitler's generals. A lot of them want to go to Moscow. Right? They want a focused, straight line, armor group center, line yep. drive uh, to Moscow. Where Hitler, he's always kind of more concerned about taking more territory, and especially economic territory, particularly Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. Grain, and then oil of the, of the Caspian Sea that's, you know, you know, if you get over there into the Northern Caucasus. Um, and so if you look at Romania, right, it is further east, right? You already kind of mm -hmm. have... You know, if you're going to start attacking from there, it's you, your start line is further east. It's right next to Ukraine. Plus, you've got the Black Sea, which gives you more strategic options to be able to use uh, naval um, resources, you know, in that area. They're like kind of limited because you have to use Bulgarian or Romanian navies, which are small. What other kind of like German ships you can get in there? Um, the Turks allow a few small ships through the straits. Yep. Uh, that's the whole thing. But Still, like, at the, as you know, air bases. You know, to, if, you, if you can bring Luftwaffe down there, it means you can strike deep into Ukraine. You mean you can hit uh, Crimea? It's only like an hour yep. flight or something like that. So, like, it's really important, you know, as a base. Um, and then, the lastly, is the Romanian armed forces. Right. That that's another big important thing when you're looking at Barbarossa is that. The Romanian army, um, just manpower wise, it provides you more soldiers, hundreds of thousands of men, you know, hundreds of aircraft. Um, Romania does not have much of an industry, so mm -hmm. it's not very mechanized. Um, so it only has like one armored division, um, mm -hmm. which the Germans actually have been helping train and create kind of turn it into a panzer division as much as possible. Uh, there's also some. Cav cavalry regiments that are motorized that kind of right. are very panzer like right they kind of it's kind of like with the french where your kind of aggressive uh tank units are the ones that with that are given to the uh cav cavalry units right um, yeah but yeah so you know those things are really important so um so briefly before we get into it we should talk about who antonescu is right this is an army group that's named after Antonescu. Uh, he was born in 1882 into a military family, um, uh, fairly prominent. He has like uh, uncles and people who were like royal adjutants. So basically mm -hmm. very kind of privileged military family. He's able to use those connections to ladder climb, um, get into prestigious, you know, uh, he's a cavalryman, you know, if you can see it by his pants there. <laughs> Sticks out for sure, literally. <laughs> but so he's he's um um he's kind of has a his career is rather unremarkable, accepting that how he kind of line jumps because of these connections, you know, because mm -hmm. he gets introduced to the king. Um, he's in the there's a big peasant revolt in 1907, and he has his men fire on a mob and kill people, and that gets some recognition with the with the monarch. Um, he gets a plum assignment to uh, Prezan as an operation off officer. Konstantin Prezan is like the general of one of the armies in 1916, who himself is a royal favorite. Um, okay. So it seems that he's competent enough, but really, like part of the way he's is he's he's making advancements is because of who he knows and you know these connections. And right. uh, Konstantin Prezan, this, he becomes the chief of the general staff. During World War One, which you know elevates Antonescu, you know, he, you know, as his uh, operations officer, he goes to Paris in 1919 as part mm -hmm. of the Romanian like representatives during the peace conference. 
He gets a plum assignment to Paris um, as a military attaché after the war. Um, he takes over, comes back from there and um, is in charge of the uh, Superior School of War. He doesn't really distinguish himself as an academic, which he's not. Uh, he, I think the, the scuttlebutt is that he never taught a class, never lectured. Uh, he's like the one you know commandant to never have done that. Um, he had a nickname, uh, 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 kind of, some say Kunile Roshu, like the red dog. It's, I've seen, I think it's just Roshu, like he had red hair. Okay. Uh, he had some red hair, and so they called him the, kind of the, the red one. He had, he was infamous for bad temper. And interestingly, like in Romania, the, there's a negative stereotypes about Jews is that Jews have red hair. And so that people that have red hair are seen as either Jewish or having negative, quote unquote, Jewish characteristics. So there were some people kind of calling him the red haired one, kind oh, of saying at him, saying yeah. that he was maybe Jew, part Jewish or at least like acting like a Jew being, you know, mean and angry and this, that, like a, this idea of ruddy men. It's kind of an interesting, you know, personality. He's not a, he's not a lovable person. He's not like a soldier mm -hmm. general. He's very like strict. Um, but he's seen as like very, uh, he's seen as incorruptible, which helps okay. him yeah. be able to like become chief of staff. Yeah. He gets in con, he can kind of gets in conflict with the King Carol the second who's seen as very corrupted. He has a quote unquote Jewish mistress, mm -hmm. even though, um, Elena, her name is like Elena Lupescu. Uh, she's actually the child of converted Jews. Both of them are Christianized. Mm -hmm. One to orthodoxy, one to Catholicism, and she herself is like secular and like have this has this relationship with uh, King Carol, um, and so but like to the nationalists and the fascists, she's Jewish, which right. means this is like this corrupt monarchy versus ooh Antonescu, he's this you know clean, incorrupt, general, disciplined guy, and he actually courts the far right, the Christian nationalists, the fascists. He's courting them to be able to advance his his, his political career. So he, people, he later on during the war, he's like, "Oh, I'm just a simple soldier." Oh, okay. But yeah. <laughs> really, he's a polit he's, he's a political animal. Yeah, where have we heard that before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, like it's it's ridiculous, but like it's kind of interesting though. People will still kind of quote them like, "Oh, is he 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 was a bad politician. He didn't know what he was doing." I'm like, you don't just accidentally become dictator. <laughs> you know, like you don't just like whoops. <laughs> I don't know, I picked it or not. Yeah, it doesn't happen that way. Um, but basically, with 1940, by that point, you know, with having lost the territory to the Soviet Union, um, King Carol II is also forced to kind of give up uh, to give up uh, part of northern Transylvania to the right. Hungarians, and that's a big blow, and um, it weakens him and allows Antonescu to carry out a coup. Because he's got German support, the Germans support him and uh, uh, trust him a lot more than they do uh, Carol II, and the the legionaries trust Antonescu, so they join, so they'll support him, and so he kicks uh, Carol II out. He brings his son to power, Mihai the first. So there's still a monarchy, but Antonescu takes all power. He calls himself Conducator, which is the Romanian equivalent of leader of Führer. Okay. Uh, and so he basically has all power in the state, but they're still technically a king. So it's kind of like with Italy, where Mussolini is the duce, but there was still, you know, yeah. Victor Emmanuel, yeah. you know, kind of as a figurehead. Um, and so there's a short term, like national legionary state that's set up um, in uh, September of 1940, where you have um, Antonescu bring in some of the fascists into his government. Uh, the fascists start trying to like kind of create a, uh, national revolution and set up their own kind of parallel government and they want to take over. They want to be in power. And so there's uh, a legionary rebellion in January 1941 that gets crushed by okay. Antonescu using the military because the military supports him, middle class supports him, most of the peasants support him. Um, the, the legionaries have kind of, they've done some, they have lost, they were once popular but have lost support. Don't want to get too much into it. Um, but so then after, so by January 1941, you basically have a straight military dictatorship. He's fascistic. I don't think he's a fascist. There's still arguments about this, but like right. he's not using a single party. Um, he's he's using, he will he will still use some legionaries, the legionaries who are willing to like 
cooperate with him, kind of be in his regime. Like a lot of them come back, especially once they um, invade the Soviet Union. The, the hardcore like legionaries get put in prison or go into exile, the leadership. Um, but you kind of have this military dictatorship that gets put in. And from the very get-go, he's pushing to have a war with the Soviet Union. You know, he's dropping hints. He's oh, okay. meeting with Hitler once in a while. He wants to. He wants there to be a war with the Soviet Union, so that they can get back this territory lost in 1940. Right. And also, he thinks that if we prove that, you know, we're better allies in Hungary, then Hitler will give us back Northern Transylvania that we lost to the Hungarians. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, because I, I just wanted to ask real quick about about the. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. <laughs> Hungarian Romanian I relationship. I don't know what better way to say it because there's a lot of contention there. Obviously, <clears throat> can you just really explain real briefly why there's such contention there? They both want Transylvania. That's 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 the easy answer. Transylvania um, was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Right. Um, the Hungarians had a, a large, a fairly large minority in there. The Romanians kind of are. Romanians are kind of in the in the um, countryside, they make up the majority. Right. You know, it, it, after World War One, Romania is able to annex it and take it over. So now Romania has this big, a bunch of ethnic Hungarians. Even today, there's still a, a large group of ethnic Hungarians in Transylvania within Romania. And so basically, that's the main issue is who controls Transylvania. Makes sense. Yeah, it's just because, again, I keep going to the, the World War One and how that all comes together and then their allies, because, again, it's not the first time this happens in that war. So it's a little difficult to wrap my head around sometimes. All right, now, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but this is kind of more for me than for, I kind of go over this, but I think it's really interesting here to kind of bring in and go over how the Romanians yeah. find out about Operation Barbarossa, because right. this plan, the Germans have been planning, right, since, you know, late in forty. But they're not bringing, they're not telling the Romanians. But okay. it's important to understand that they understand that they can count on the Romanians to act as a base, probably even pro provide troops. So they're, the, Roman, the Germans are basically counting on the Romanians to participate, even when they're not, uh, even though they've not told them. Um, and it's like a hard winter. There's this like political crisis. The Romanians are distracted. They don't know this is coming. Right. Uh, Antonescu, when he meets with Hitler here and there, He's pushing for war, but he he thinks it's out there. He, he thinks he's trying to convince Hitler. He doesn't realize Hitler's kind of already turned after the you know Battle of Britain that Hitler right. already is focused on this. Yep. Um, so in early April and third of April, General Hansen, uh, right? He's the one I told in the beginning, the chief of the German military mission to Romania. He suggests to the Romanian army to bring their troops up to two thirds strength in Moldavia, uh, the kind of eastern part of Romania. Yep. Um, and a few, but a few days later, the German campaigns against Greece and Yugoslavia began. Right, so it's like, okay, this may be just like it, it's spring, like the you know springtime. We got to mobilize some troops. You know, the Germans are going in to the south there. They just want to make sure that the Russians don't get any ideas. Right, so the Romanians are still kind of focused on bringing you know planting and other things. Right, um, twenty four May, uh, General uh, Eugene uh, Jürgen von Schubert uh, arrives to take command of German Eleventh Army which is this German army that's being created on the eastern border of Romania. Um, and so his arrival starts kind of uh, alerting Romanians that something may be up. Okay. Um, at this, you know, a couple of days later, Hansen asked the Romanians to go to full strength by the 10th of June on the frontier. But he says this was only for defensive measures. Um, Antonescu, uh, I think they're starting to realize, like, okay, Maybe I'm getting this war. He's he he said he'd be in to set up the uh, Model A Cartier General. That's what MCG stands for, which is the general headquarters. Okay. Right. So he, as especially as a military man, he is not going to like just be in Bucharest. He's going to go with the army right. um, to the front. So he starts setting up a front kind of a, uh, a headquarters near the front where the front's going to be. Um, a few days later, at the end of May, 31st of May. Um, Council of Ministers meets without Antonescu. It's like this, is, this is all the ministers in Bucharest. And they're the first ones to start talking about war preparations. Like, okay, okay we might get bombed. You know, we're going to, like, need to bring in the harvest. You know, we got to take up, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, air defense. we got to start organizing that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Like, right. So they're realizing something's coming, but they're kind of – it's very – it's still kind of vague. 
on the 12th of June. So we're getting really down to the wire here is when Hagar and UNESCO <laughs> meet, right? Finally in Munich. Wow. So we're 10 days out from the invasion and Hitler doesn't actually tell him there's an invasion coming. Well, he doesn't tell him the exact date, but he kind of talks like okay. something's going to happen. Wow. Right? Okay. There's probably going to be a war. He's kind of sounding out. He's doing similar things with like the Hungarians, like uh, the Finns at the same time. Um you know, and this is kind of where they talk about setting up an army group under Antonescu, right? Which hmm. is a big prestige to name like an army group for him, put German troops under him. Yeah. And then von Schubert will kind of act as a liaison, quote unquote, you know, like, you know, his uh, his yeah. deputy or aide. Um, there's a good um, possibility that they also talked about kind of the criminal orders, maybe yeah. not in detail, but this idea that kind of talking about if in the coming war, this isn't going to be just an invasion. This is going to be a war of annihilation to destroy mm. Jewish Bolshevism. Right. And Antonescu is hundred percent on board with that as are most of the army officer corps, much of Romania. Like they've, like I said, fascism is, it was a popular movement. You know, it's a conservative society. There's a lot of anti-Semitism, anti-communism. They believe in this idea of Judeo Bolshevism. Um, so then mix up in this. So right five days later on the 17th, now you have a council of minister meetings raising the possibility of a quote purification of the population. Yeah. End quote. Now this is, you know, again, so this is a Romanian initiative, right? This is in Bucharest. They're the ones who are kind of saying, Hey, we can also turn this into a chance to, uh, ethnically cleanse these territories, especially of Jews, but they're also going to target, um, uh, Slavic groups, you know, there's, there's, Bessarabia had been not fully, it wasn't fully ethnic Romanian, right? There was a lot of right. Russians in the cities, Bulgarians in the south, um, Ukrainians in the countryside, along with the Romanians. Uh, you know, Bessarabia basically lines up, not well, but like the majority of the Republic of Moldova today, right? And right. then some parts of Ukraine, right around Odessa, like so it's an ethnically mixed up area. And so like the Romanians are starting to think, Hey, we can go, when we go to retake this, we can use this as an opportunity to ethnically cleanse it. Hmm. So it's only on the 18th of June that Hitler finally gives Antonescu the actual start date. Wow. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. Just real quick. I just, I didn't know it was this close. I, I knew it was close ish. I didn't know it was this close. Like that is, that's mind boggling. It's five days. <laughs> That's yeah, this four is days. four it's, days. That's yeah, crazy. it's four days to prepare four this. Days. I mean, they've they've gotten mobilized, but and, you know, it's in this the next day is when the first like offensive operational orders are sent out by the Model de Cartier General. Um, so like it's it, and that's kind of once again, if we're kind of looking at like David Stahill's work about um kind of the poor planning. Yeah. Right. And the yeah. lot of this is super vague. We're gonna get the orders here in a second. But like, but this was also very German. It's kind of like kicking the yeah. door and you know, see what develops, you know. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And it's like 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 the Western Front in World War One, where like Hindenburg basically in 1918 is just like, let's do what we always do and attack and then see yeah. reinforce success. Yeah, and then much. you know, like, but it's 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 kind of incredible that they don't give the Romanians some more detail. They don't mention Odessa. They were actually discussed trying to have the Romanians take Odessa um, in secret. And they assumed the Romanians couldn't do it. So they weren't going to assign that to them. But importantly, on the 19th of June, the next day, uh, the third the, okay, no, okay. Well, yeah, we can, we can move over there because this will work. Um, this because as they're setting up army group at Tinescu, you know, you have these different armies. It's created of three armies. Okay. So once again, at the top here, we have Antonescu uh, and Ioannizio, Ioannizio, sorry, as his chief of staff. So kind of the, basically the Romanian general staff turns into right. the great generals, the great general headquarters when it goes on campaign. So Makes he sense. kind of hold, has both. So he'll act as Antonescu's in charge. He really should be the king, but like it's him yep. because he's become dictator. The king's not informed of any of this. And then the chief of staff. So they're going to technically be in control. Von Schubert, 
right, is like kind of liaison. He, he's in control of the German 11th Army. Right. And important to point out that this army um, has no panzer divisions. Right. So it is just a full kind of traditional infantry artillery army, basically, you know, with most a lot of horses, some motorization. Right. Um, this is one of the reasons why they don't um, allow them to try to take Odessa. Okay. Uh, because yeah. like they think that if you 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 can't do that with that limited of of troops, and they have to hold it back. They're gonna see you're gonna basically the plan is that like they kind of have to. But we'll get into that in a little minute. But like it, that's something important. But the interesting thing about the German Eleventh Army though is that um, on the nineteenth they subordinate one of the other Romanian armies to it. The Romanian Third Army on a Dumitrescu. Okay. So the Romanians have already lost control of one of their armies because they've actually given it to the German 11th Army. It's not actually really under the Romanian general headquarters anymore. Right. And this, okay. This is the best Romanian army. It's it's two corps, but it's the Mountain Corps and the Cavalry Corps. Okay. So these are mixed mountain brigades that are kind of beefed up. They're more like a division, and the cavalry divisions are kind of smaller. They're, they're cavalry, but they also have motorized units. Um, yeah. But that means these are the most highly trained units that are also trained to operate kind of independently, all around combined arms kind of forces, you know. Um, yeah. So, and in, in addition, there's kind of like the artillery reserve, the best like artillery is given to the German 11th Army. So the Romanian artillery units, like heavy artillery, motorized artillery, they're given to the German 11th Army and Romanian 3rd Army. So like they're giving all like the best Romanian <laughs> stuff under them. Plus, I talked about this Romanian, the first armored division that the Germans were trying to, that were Germans were trying to right. It's yep. mainly equipped with like French and Czech tanks. Um, it's given to German 11th Army. So, it, of some, which is important. So, like the German 11th Army, its major uh, armor unit is a Romanian division. It kind of pulls together from some reconnaissance groups to form like a motorized ad hoc unit that it attaches to it. It also further takes most of the motorized cavalry from the Romanian 3rd Army's Cavalry Corps and puts it under the German control so that they have this kind of actual motorized. A horse mobile force as mostly mm -hmm. Romanian okay. and it's all under the Germans and the, so the interesting thing is at this time when you sign over all that you know that they're going to be going beyond uh, the Dniester River which was the old border right? because the Germans are basically telling them we're going and this third army is coming with us we're actually taking the best best units and kind of putting them under uh, rest Romanian units that we've, we've evaluated and they're probably not, they, they're thinking they're not going to stop until the Easter. So several, yeah, that's like the Boog and then the Easter, you know, yep. into Ukraine. So, so yep. there's this kind of Romanian idea that like, oh, they were just going to go to like liberate Romania. Like, no, like from okay. the 19th, this thir Romanian third army is signed over to the German 11th army. And everybody knows it's going much, much further, deeper than just to liberate Romanian territory. It's going to be going deep into the Soviet Union, right? And the other thing, you know, they also, the interesting thing with the German Love Family for this period, they also had what they called model divisions. So they had three originally that they started training in like fall of, uh, sorry, winter of 44, of 40. They added two more in the spring, but these are like infantry divisions that the Germans have had trained as much as they could in the, in the few minutes. And so those all go under German 11th Army to support it. So they've got like, these are the guys, the, the best troops, the best infantry divisions that they've, the Germans have helped train, best equip, you know, mountain and cavalry troops, all under the Germans. Then you have the Romanian Fourth Army. <laughs> it's that and one. under Tuperka, who's the guy to the right, who is actually directly controlled by Antonescu. Like Antonescu gives him order, he's going to do it. Antonescu gives von Schubert an order, it's more of a suggestion, right? But right. Von Schubert gives Dumitrescu an order. It's an order. It's an order. Right. Um, but so the Romanian third or fourth army is bigger, but it's all just okay. infantry. And infantry, just yeah. 
it's 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 just regular infantry. They've taken away, like I said, a lot of their best guns. M- most mobile guns are up to are given to the Germans and the main third army. Wow. Um, so fourth army is kind of like they got some reserve divisions. Uh, they've got the Granicher, which is the border guards, right? Um, the, you know, which are regiments that are usually used to do borders policing. Yeah. And they kind of like give them some artillery and turn them into a a, a division, an infantry division. And expecting like, well, you guys fight, you know, bandits and stuff, so you're gonna be good. I'm like, <laughs> they're huh. they're considered elite because they like have like some experience in small arms and stuff. But like, right? Does they're that really prepared for this? Does that is that sort of elite? Sorry, just quick question. I know this is confusing. We have some questions, but does that eliteness come? Is you know applied by the Germans or the Romanians themselves? Because when the I hear Romanians, it, I don't think the Germans uh, see the Granicera as elite. Oh, okay. Because um, I was going to say, when you hear about these guys who are good at height, you know, fighting bandits, we know what that actually means. So, well, listen, so the, the Granicera fighting like it's like they're like interwar frontier police. So like they're fighting yeah. like uh, the Comitage. If you've heard of these guys, like Bulgarian, yeah, you know, revolutionaries and the Macedonia, like the, they're they're fighting like smugglers. They're like shooting at Hungarian border guards that have all the skirmishes or with the Soviets. Yeah. So they're doing that kind of like small unit stuff. And they they just have to sign on for a little longer. So like they're like probably more experienced, but like the kind of fighting this is going to be is yeah. And they and they don't have very much artillery. Like they're kind of like because these are they don't need artillery to don't need it, yeah. the frontier, right? Now they're being asked, you know, to fight into this. So we're going to see like some of the problems that Fourth Army has is because it's kind of everything else um and yeah. all the best stuff has gone to the german 11th army uh, or romanian third army which is under german 11th army. um and then to finish out round out army group antonescu is you have uh german luftflotte four the powerful one is is assigned to it and then the rain air force uh, in particularly the uh, gruppare ariana uh de lupta or the air combat group um, okay. so is what they call it which is going to kind of go forward with that all right. Okay. So I think that kind of breaks down kind of showing you this. This like, So you have about like 325,000 Romanian troops, um, and roughly like 100,000 maybe German, maybe, 100, maybe a little more, a little less. I think it kind of depends. Some of them are still arriving. So I think right. I, it's hard for me to try to nail down exactly um, how big German 11th Army was. But it gets, I think it's about 100,000, 115 eventually. Uh, but you can see this is a pre- predominantly Romanian force. Um, that's going in. Um, and so let's get to their mission real quick and we'll try to finish this off. So um, on the 18th, they get this trifold assignment. Uh, number one, protect Ploiesht in the oil fields. <laughs> that's um, <laughs> and, and some other vital in- infrastructure. I have photos here. The top photo is, uh, of course, the oil fields in Ploiesht. The middle one is the Chernavoda Bridge. It's a bridge over the Danube. It still stands it takes it it's heading to Constanza where there's a port which is the last yeah. image yeah. and so that port is really important because you can send out oil and grain down through the Turkish Straits or you can load it up and you can take stuff by river so like these are kind of like the major things that are mentioned the oil fields Chernovoda bridge the port um, and they also says the siege bridgeheads right so like they will very first day remain able siege bridgeheads. And this is basically to try to pin down the Soviets and to make them think that there's going to be a major attack out of Romania. Okay. As you're waiting for army groups, German army groups, um, north, center, and south to advance and conquer their way through the border in, um, in Soviet-occupied Poland. Number two, defend against Soviet air raids and airborne attacks. Right? You know, makes sense. And like I said, so the third is third, pin down Soviet ground forces be encircled once. So you're going to basically wait for army group south to arrive, and then army group Antonescu will meet up and hopefully um, capture and destroy some uh, Soviet forces. And so like kind of further operations, I kind of already mentioned, right? This is, it's pretty much, they understand that this isn't just we, we cross the Prut River, which is the border now, and we march to the Dniester River, which is the border you know, the interwar, the interwar barrier, border, then we stop. Uh, the Romanians definitely know that the Third Army is going to be going further into deeper into the Ukraine. Um, it's less clear if Romanian Fourth Army is going to cross and go further. Right. Um, 
there is an interesting kind of debate here about extermination orders going down to the Romanian hierarchy. I know that German 11th Army is per, receives the criminal orders yeah. um, coming through uh, OKH, German, you know, headquarters, German Army headquarters. There's some Romanian testimony after the war from a cavalry unit that claim that they got some kind of similar orders to uh, exterminate um, Jews. The only problem is that um, these the colonel in charge of the regiment was killed later on in the war. Okay. And so these guys in the post-war like in investigation, it's in their interest to point the finger at that colonel. Right. And say that they were just following orders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they also then report, because they, they get these similar orders, but they do it like a, a little bit later, like a week and a half later, when they actually cross the Prut and the main attack, which is what we're going to, we'll talk about in a second here. So yeah. I, I'm dubious that there actually were these orders the day before Barbarossa kicks off. Um, the Romanian officers want revenge. Uh, they blame the Soviet occupation. Uh, the Romanians had to withdraw in 1940, and yeah. the army kind of felt abused, and some of its troops were disarmed. They blame Jews for inciting locals and leading them. Um, they actually murder several hundred Jews. There's kind of a pogrom-like atmosphere in 40. So there's a sense of let's go, okay. when we go back, we're going to not just liberate, but we're going to take revenge. Yeah. And so I don't think you really need to have any kind of orders coming down. This is something right. that officers were going to do regardless. Now, some orders will come down that we have a lot of good. Um, and I'm going to we'll probably be talking about this, but um, we actually have a really good proof of that. And so that's another reason why I don't think these orders, these claims are orders right before the, the invasion are cold water because we have no kind of indication except for some oral testimony. Right. Whereas we have some later very clear stuff that comes down. Yeah, which is very problematic. Uh, just a quick question here, because um, again, we are had other questions, but I'm sure they'll be answered as we move forward. Uh, but munitions, are they different between the German forces and the Romanian forces? Um, I guess it kind of depends. Um, so the Romanians use Mauser rifles, so a lot of that kind of small okay. arm stuff is going to be not too different. Right. Um, we also the Romanians a lot of their 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 new weapons are the new artillery and stuff and some of the machine guns are checkmate and who controls all that? Yeah, the Germans control all that now, so they're you know check. You know, so the Romanians have that. There's a lot of old like French uh, seventy five caliber stuff, but who's also using a lot of that? So yeah. it's it's <laughs> different, um, but it's I don't think it's super problematic. Okay, yeah. And, and well, some of it is overlap. Some of it does overlap. Like yeah, there's and, like there was in the German army. So yeah, makes perfect sense. But yeah, so before I jump into this timeline, we can see that that the army group Antonescu is formed in kind of a backwards S. So kind of facing yeah. north is a Romanian third army, and it's going to do this left hook, kind of go attack up north, and then. Um, turn east and then cross into uh, Ukraine. The German Third Army is then kind of all along the river, kind of heading from north to south. And it's going to punch kind of northeast towards Mogilev and go as far as fast as possible that way and try to cross the Dniester River and then keep going. Yeah. Uh, to, um, and then um, below it is Romanian Fourth Army, um, all that's going to kind of just attack east, and then very long is the th uh, is is actually unattached. It's kind of an independent second corps. It later joins fourth army, but at this point it's kind of oriented north. It's it's going to attack over the Danube up into um, southern Bessarabia, which today is now part of Ukraine, right? Uh, where right. a lot of these ports that are getting hit, Ismail, uh, Reni are right there. Um, so, but. If, when the on the 22nd of June, they aren't attacking except local attacks. They aren't okay. doing a major attack. They want to. They need to kind of mark time until Army Group South, German Army Group South, arrives through Poland. Right. So, so they'll open up in a big artillery blast. They're trying to you know hit the Soviets. They will capture bridgeheads on the other side at Skulen and other places, and um, you know kind of. Uh, trying to make a show of force and pin down the Soviets. 
Um, now, the Soviets have a lot of troops in Ukraine. It's actually the southern flank is actually some of its uh, most reinforced of all, you know. Yeah. And, and plus, Romania, like I said, it's further out. So it's, it's just kind of by itself. Yeah. And so it starts coming under these bridge huds come under increased pressure. The Axis were actually thinking about, um, uh, sorry, von Schubert was talking to Antonescu, like, all right, let's talk on the 25th of June. We've had a few days. Let's try to do a big attack. Uh, but the Soviets counterattack and all these bridgeheads, which kind of throws things off and actually eliminates several of them. They aren't destroyed, but they have to be evacuated. Um, there's okay. actually a Soviet landing across the river in one area. Oh, wow. Actually, okay. So, like, there's it for so for a few days, it seemed like things are going to fall apart. Um, and this is the context is actually a pogrom in Yash, hmm. right near the front. And it's part of this anxiety. It's getting hit by Soviet bombers. Yash has a large Jewish population, like a third of the city or maybe half is Jewish. And, you know, uh, kind of there's all these rumors of spies and Soviet mm, yeah. fifth columnists who have to yeah. be Jews. And it, I don't want to get too much into it, but there's this pogrom that kills at least 8,000 Jews um, by Romanian soldiers. Uh, some German soldiers are involved and Romanian civilians. Um, so it's just kind of to remind us that this, is very much tied up that this is both fighting but also massacres and mass murder going on at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Axis forces are able to kind of hold off, regroup, and as the army group south starts nearing, the Soviets realize they, they have to start getting out of the way or they're going to get a bit trapped. And so this right. uh, army group Antonescu finally launches its attack on the 2nd of July. So very quickly... Up in the north, Third Army encounters little resistance. It's able to take Chenauts, which is kind of the major capital of northern Bukovina, um, uh, fairly quickly. Uh, and you can see here, and this isn't, we'll get to this instead, but there's not much territory to take in this right. area before they yep. hit the Dniester and they're going to be getting into Ukraine. Um, interesting, at this time is when these orders start coming down from right. not from the military, but from the Ministry of Defense, uh, sorry, the Ministry of the Interior. Or internal oh. affairs. Okay. They control the gendarmerie, the gendarmes. Yeah. And so the Romanian army doesn't have military police. Okay. They assign gendarmes as part of the military police. So each <laughs> corps will have a gendarme assignment. So you have like it's kind of militarized gendarmes that are going to be working for the army. And behind them, they're also going to send these regular gendarmes under the Ministry of the Internal Affairs. And they have three conferences from the sixth, second to the sixth of July, where they're told, part of as you advance behind the front, you will cleanse the terrain yeah. of Jews. You'll murder them, or you'll gather them into ghettos, and, or camps in preparation to deport them. But, and so we have very clear that this is the, these gendarmes have orders that are coming in behind to commit atrocities. The soldiers are committing atrocities already. Those officers I talked about, they've given speeches, they've selected shooters. Yeah. They're But they're doing that kind of on their own initiative um, to take revenge for what they see as Jewish perfidy, uh, perfidy in the year before. Whereas these right. gendarmes, they have orders to, to do this as they come up behind. And interestingly, at the same time, 4th of July, Einsatzgruppe Day, Arrives so this SS um, special task force you know, of killers uh, shows up, which once again, this is why we have an Einsatz group a day, right? It was originally just A, B, C yep. for German armies, North uh, German army groups, uh, North, uh, Center, and South, and they yep. add this fourth one uh, later, specifically for Army Group Antonescu. Um, so to make kind of like you know, long story short, I guess, the German left army is able to punch through. It's got a lot of power behind it. It's got these uh, mobile Romanian units, uh, and it doesn't have very far to go to get to Mogilev. And the Soviets are actually already trying to get away there. Yes. Down further south, the Soviets are fighting and holding on a bit more. The terrain is a bit more hilly, and mm -hmm. its fourth, fourth army doesn't isn't as well equipped. It gets right. kind of stuck for a bit and takes some heavy casualties. So... Um, von Schubert, he then takes the Romanian 1st Armored Division and redirects it to the south to take Kishinev, or Kishinev 
uh, which um, it was the capital of Bessarabia. And so on the 16th of July, it, you know, they're able to roll in there and that kind of unhinges the Soviet defenses right. in the south, which means they all start retreating, try to get over the Dniester, try to basically a lot of them are trying to get to Odessa. Um, and that allows the fourth army to advance and the second corps from the south there to move across into the Delta area and that waterlog region to advance up that way. So, <laughs> all right, let's, like, let's, like, let's move to the next uh, slide and I'll, <clears throat> I have some photos here. This is a kind of a complex slide uh, with the map here, um, but the photos are kind of showing Romanian soldiers advancing, but you also have, um, so you have the, um, but you also have atrocities. So the middle photo on the right, those are Jews under guard um, yep. being either before or being deported or put in a ghetto on the bottom left. That's also, that's a, that's a, seen from the Kishino ghetto that gets set up. But then you also on the bottom right, you have these like celebration liberation parades. Uh, upper <laughs> right, you've got um, German Romanian solidarity, uh, yeah. German soldier flanked by two Romanian soldiers. Yeah. Kind of army group Antonescu in miniature, right? Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Um, now, this we're not going to get too much. The thing about this map that I don't like <laughs> is sure. that yeah. it's playing a trick on you. Okay, because it's called the actions of the Romanian, Romanian and German troops for the liberation of uh, Bessarabia. Okay, yeah, northern Bukovina uh, and the Herzl region, which that's there's a little bit of territory the Soviets took that was anyway, but it's showing them only taking that territory. But the reality is that this, in time wise, the time it took to get all of this liberated, the German fourth uh, sorry german 11th army and uh Romanian third army uh, it didn't just stop at that river the Dniester. Right. yep this map really should have them off the page over the river into the ukraine by by the time that you have the liberation down there so it's kind of playing a trick it's yeah it's making it seem like the romanians were only kind of going for legitimate territory that they controlled right for the war, and that there's this chance, a missed opportunity of stopping on the Dniester and doing what Finland did. Right. That Because okay. Finland kind of mostly advances to its old border and basically stops. Stops, yeah. And so there's all this kind of post-war, and even in, during the war, animists are saying, oh, if Antonescu had just stopped at the Dniester, everything would be fine. We would have been fine. <laughs> yeah. No. You know, we were with all within our rights. Well, A... I've included these pictures of atrocities to just remind yeah. you the mass murder of Jews going on at the entire time here. Yeah. And then B, it was never in the cars. The minute you cross the Prut, the Romanian third army is already committed to crossing the Dniester and yeah. pretty likely that the Romanian fourth army will eventually cross as well. And right. so this map, like really the German and Romanian forces in the North should be over the river already deeping, going deeper into Ukraine by yeah. the time that you know the southern part of Bessarabia is liberated by Romanian Fourth Army, where what is this map from? Uh, it's from a Romanian uh, uh, a Romanian military history book. Okay, so but this is the way they like to present it. Yeah, right. And I didn't really do it. I, I but it, it's it's basically a trick. It's, it, yeah, I think it's purposeful to a certain extent because it's just it reinforces that narrative. And it's like if Antonescu had only stopped there, if Romania had only stopped there, we would have been fine. Right. And it's like, well, A, you have to ignore the fact that there's all this ethnic cleansing going on yeah. from day one. And B, this isn't how it actually looked, right? Like, yeah. you have to include the fact that Third Army immediately followed German 11th Army at Mogilev and was already going there. And pretty much when once it's the Rubicon moment was crossing yeah. the route. The Rubicon right. moment was joining the invasion. It wasn't three weeks into the invasion. I see what you mean. Yep. Yeah, I got you. Right. Yeah, it mean, makes sense. Yeah. In the Romanian historiography, there's this idea that like that was the that was the, the Rubicon moment was when you cross the Dniester. And there's a kind of a pause. It's like, no, there's no pause. Like right. the minute right. they get there, they like pause for like a day or two just to collect their logistics and then they're they're cross. Move across the river. Yeah. There's no debate. There's no yeah. kind of like hand wringing. There's no German, uh, there's no Romanian generals and saying, Don't do this, which is what they say later. 
right? I think there's like one politician who <laughs> isn't, you know, doesn't have any power who's yeah. willing to say like, and even he is still saying like, we should take all the land to the Easter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect so sense. So even the yeah. opposition basically is like, yeah. but pretty much nobody is saying don't go deeper into the Soviet Union. Within a few years, especially after the war, they set up this narrative of like, oh, if only we had stopped. Right, like, I see what you mean. If yeah. you only stopped, you still would have massacred all these Jews. You yeah. still would have like, you know, it's like, and it's ridiculous. The minute you join in, the minute you get on board with the, you know, Barbarossa, that's, that's, it's too late. That's where you've already gone wrong. Yeah. Makes perfect sense to me. All right, so we can kind of wrap up um, the fighting here because yeah. this army group lasts about a month, basically. So as I already kind of said, right. you know, talking about on the 16th of July is like these are uh, the first armored division, the remaining first armored divisions going south. You have German 11th Army, 3rd Army crossing the river. Uh, a few days later, the, the remaining takes reach Tagina, which is down south, which kind of finishes their kind of crazy ride, opening up the way for Romanian yep. Fourth Army. Right. Um, and so by the 26th of July, Antonescu de declares Barbara uh, Bessarabia liberated, even though you actually still have Soviet troops uh, holding on to Chitatia Alba, which is kind of all the way down um, at the mouth of the uh, river into the Black Sea. Okay. Um, and so at once... But now that you can kind of see, this is why Army Group Antonescu falls apart, is that okay. you have Romanian Fourth Army that's kind of finally getting and occupying the southern portion of Bessarabia, while German 11th Army and 3rd Army, which German 11th Army controls 3rd Army, are well into, into Ukraine. It's no longer kind of yeah, okay. yep. one force. It's it's breaking into two, where you have basically right. the Romanian General Headquarters in control of 4th Army, and German 11th Army in, char in charge of Romanian 3rd Army. And it's headed for the Dnieper. It's headed for Crimea eventually. And then within a few days, so, um, you know, five days of the liberation, it was actually, he already gets this, but like he enters to agree to a hit request. So from, so from a day or two earlier to have the Romanian 4th Army cross the Dniester and go into Odessa. So once again, there isn't a pause. There isn't this kind of like the... Th Third Army and Fourth Army sit on the Easter and like, yeah, oh, should yeah. we really do this? Should we take this giant leap? It's like, no, the decision was already made. Right. We want to make some like, you know, Third Army was already committed to go with German Eleventh Army, pretty much all the way to the the Dnieper, which is right. as far as the Germans really thought that they needed it, because they thought the Russian the Red Army would collapse, be destroyed. Oh, yeah, right. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And so like, then the Romanians could just help occupy some territory. Yeah. They're going to keep asking. Third Army to go further and further, eventually into, into um, um, Crimea. And this is the same thing kind of here with the Reign of Fourth Army, right? They're like, <clears throat> they now that they're like, things are going so well, but they're like, oh, crap, there's Odessa. There's this big city with an ar independent army there threatening yes. our logistics. Yeah. Well, what are we going to do with it? Well, we didn't trust the Romanians to do it, but hey, let's ask them. And so they get <laughs> asked to go do that. Right. And so once again, these photos I have Romanian soldiers marching into battle, but then that middle photo is um, Jews being deported because as the Romanians take over this land that they've liberated, they are starting to shove, as soon as they, the other side of the river is in control of, of the Axis, they start shoving Jews across the river to, into Ukraine, deporting them. And sometimes the SS, the Einsatz group a day, will be like, what are you doing? And push them back. We don't want these troops. And the German army will, doesn't want, von Schubert says, he's like, we don't want these Jews in our rear area. It's a danger. Yeah. It's a danger to our logistics, yada, 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 all that. And so these Jews die getting pushed back and forth just from exhaustion. And sometimes the, the SS just shoot them because, yeah. you know, and then at other times the Romanians like shoot them. And then eventually they have to kind of come to disagreements where the Romanians promise to hold on to them until um later and then they can deport them later and that's a whole other story but i just want to kind of remember like remind people that this these operations are not just military operations there's genocide going on always right yeah. at, along with the with the front moving with by soldiers and then you have these gendarmes with explicit orders yeah. for gen for genocidal policies 
Well, it's uh, just a while back there, Andrea said that about when you were talking about it earlier, same old, same old. It just, it's a story we don't know, but for those of us who are interested in this, it's a story we know. It's right. no different than the other fronts or other parts of the front um, further north, um, which is not surprising at all. All right, so just to kind of finish up, um, I will go to the end of the line. This is what Hitler, oh, sorry, Antonescu says to Hitler in this um, in this message, committing Romanian Fourth Army as well to go across the okay. Eastern. And so army, we have that arm, end of Army Group Antonescu. It's, it's short-lived. It's only about a month. But I think it's really important. It, 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 it shows of what a big contribution the Romanians are making. And that right. not to Hitler's war of annihilation, to both parts, not just yeah. to fighting the Red Army, but also to murdering innocent Jews as part of it. And it gets broken up, but both those armies stay and keep fighting through the through the fall, right? And then the yeah. third army continues fighting all the way through the winter and into the and into the spring. Um, so this is just the start of what the Romanian propaganda called its holy war. And this I'm kind of this is my book that I kind of go into all this more in detail for anyone who wants to read more and, and kind of looking at the ideological underpinnings, which is what I'm arguing about. That you know the Romanians weren't unideological as, some, as they're often portrayed. They weren't unmotivated. Um, right. They're were heavily implicated and committed to this war. And so, yeah, kind of once again, kind of this Romania versus Finland thing, whereas yeah. Romania is sending two armies now over the Dniester, where Finland is basically at this point <laughs> reaching its, I think it's a little bit later. But it's later it's, yeah. I think it's in September where they actually like get to their, um, front frontier, but within so within a couple of months, Fin. But that just shows Finland is taking a much more measured advance, and once it gets to its frontier, it doesn't advance much further, and then it starts demobilizing, and has yeah. this continuation war. Whereas Romania is sending two armies, full flung, into the Soviet Union, um, and then just to give you kind of a little bit, Antonescu's fate, right? He gets toppled in uh, August of 1944 by a royal coup. Uh, gets put in prison in the Soviet Union. They we just whisk him off to Moscow for a little bit. He was brought back, put on trial uh, by a popular tribunal, people's tribunal in Bucharest a, under the Romanians, right? And not even a Romanian communist regime yet. It's, it's controlled by a pro-communist government, but it's not actually, it's like a socialist government. It's not... Um, so it's, uh, it's not a, like a full-blown communist regime yet. And then he's executed by firing squad in 1946. Um, but he almost immediately becomes this kind of nationalist hero. Yeah. <clears throat> so that he's seen as, you know, he's martyred for Romania, that all he was doing was trying to regain Romanian territory. Yeah. Uh, sure, he didn't like Jews, but... Let's, let's he save the Jews even. There's this kind of crazy... <laughs> Because not you know Romania doesn't end up it doesn't deport all of its Jews immediately yeah. deports the Jews from Bessarabia and Bukovina. It's planning on deporting the rest. The kind of realizes that shouldn't because it needs them for their labor. It sees that the war doesn't go so well. So kind of in forty two instead of having the deported to Auschwitz like Slovakia gives away is it you know sells off its Jews sells them you know not just gives them you know the yeah, them, yeah. pay for them. Yep. <clears throat> Romania decides not to do that. Um, and so some, you know, a large proportion of Romanian Jews, about as population survive. But it's not because Antonescu saved them. But that's in the 90s after the communism falls. This is this idea of this tragic hero, this great Romanian. He's, he's actually he's an anti-Semite, but he saved Jews. And but since about the mid 2000s, that's becoming more and more criticized and Officially by the Romanian government, they no longer uh, support this kind of Antonescu hero worship. But you right. get out there into um, kind of the YouTube, Twitter, yeah, social media <laughs> world. I've and seen it. Yeah, still, and this is still what he'll be remembered for: is this yeah. order of twenty second of June, nineteen forty one, of cross the Prut, you know, this heroic Romanian attempt to regain its territory but is really intermeshed and interconnected and with a Hitler's war of annihilation 
We can't disentangle those two. And I kind of hope that talking about this forgotten uh, army group, army group Antonescu, uh, helps uh, everybody kind of see what's going on here with Romania and this, and the complexities, and yeah. how, and unfortunately, just how popular the war against Judeo Bolshevism was for a lot of Europe. Yeah, thanks. That was uh, that was a great talk, and. Uh... Just have to, that one's going to be the one that's going to have to sink in for a little while, I think, with all the different movies. I knew it was going to be complicated, but I know it was going to be that complicated. Um, so that's okay. We got a few questions, if that's all right. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, just a real quick, easy one. Uh, is the book, uh, your book there, going to be uh, in, done in audio uh, book format at all? No plans of yet. I mean, I guess if they sell enough copies. Uh, well, there you go. <laughs> so other people buy it so he can he can yeah. listen to it. Yeah, I got it linked down below, so uh, get uh, get by and um, yeah, a uh, couple of ones that I just wanted to you know, hold on. Just give me a minute here. Yeah, um, I think you kind of have the answer. You kind of indirectly alluded to it. I'm just trying to find it. Oh, here it is from 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 Medi as well about <laughs> again basically a conglomeration, which I think is a good is an apt way of describing it. But was there operational challenges in that regard of having all this mix, especially when you're talking about basically throwing in what's a Romanian sort of panzer division and then all these different, you know, cavalry based mechanized units. And you just, you've got a lot mixed going on here. Um, I, there definitely were problems. Um, but I, I, I think relatively few when you look at it, the big, I mean, I don't think that much more or difficult than okay. any of the other like kind of German army groups. Uh, the German and Romanians kind of operate pretty well together. And, well, they're also kind of operating mostly separate at this point, right? So, you, okay. you right. know, German Third Army and Fourth, you know, sorry, Romanian Third Army and Fourth Army are still pretty independent. Even if you've assigned a corps over, you know, they have liaison officers. Uh, there's right. some shortages of that, but there's some Romanians that speak German. They have ethnic Germans in from Transylvania in the Romanian right. Army that can help out. Um, and the, actually, the, the Germans have a lot of praise for the Romanian First Armored Division. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of heap it full. Um, it gets sucked into the Battle of Odessa. Gets decimated um, right. uh, later on in the in the in the summer there. Um, so they can't. They kind of lose that good unit that they were they really liked because it gets sent down in, towards Odessa. But um, you know, there's there's complaints. You know, Antonescu is he's at the front. Like I said, he's like heading in and. You know, he's saying like, oh, there's not enough, uh, the, you know, there's not enough spacing between carts on, you know, wagon trains, you know, AA right. isn't done here, that. But really, it's not, I don't think there was any kind of major operational issues. The Germans okay. and Romanians really kind of collaborated pretty well. Yeah, and this is, kind of, I think you kind of answered it there, but it's a similar question about logistics, because obviously it's important and it's getting, I think, more attention, uh, rightly so. Uh, were they more in, in more or less integrated by this point? Because it sounds like the Germans had their military mission there for quite a while. So it doesn't sound like so, that would have been a major issue. So for Army Group Antonescu, logistics are, aren't too bad because it, you're starting from like right there, right? You're starting from your yeah. base. So, right. And when you, the first, you know, this part, when they retake uh, territory, these railroads will actually be the right gauge, right? They're not, we don't have any of that issue of like the wider Soviet gauge, Right. So if you can regain the railroad, you, it's already, you just have to fix up a little bit. To, um, the Romanian Fourth Army's logistics are tougher. Um, they have to, like, they, they use oxen a lot of times, like it's pretty okay. slow. Yeah. Uh, so, so even with railroads, you, you have to, you have to take time to get them back rolling after you've conquered them, right? And the right. Soviets are like pulling as much rolling stock as they can. A lot of it ends up stuck in Chitati Alba because they're trying to put right. them on ferries to take them across the Dniester to, get them to, to uh, Odessa. Right. Um, and so there yeah, are some, and like I later on, like, but at this point, you know, you're not going too far away from your logistical base. Romanian third army starts having some logistical issues because they are, are out running them up as they're driving yeah. towards Uman. And, but like uh, I've, I've, it's in my book and I've found a, there's lots of examples in uh, some literature, but they'll be, they'll take, they'll take like a stop and they'll like, Go to like a collective farm and get their soldiers. A lot of them were peasants to like grind bread, you know, grind wheat to make bread. You know, like their days. You know, they they weren't eating. You know, 
for days or something, you know, using like their emergency rations and stuff. So there is like, there is the logistics become problematic because it is, especially for the Romanians, more horse, uh, even for the German 11th army, because it's, it's, it's not yeah. a high powered mobile force. No, 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 no. It's, you know, like it's, it's, it's got more, more trucks than the Romanians do, but still no, like a lot of the horses as well. So like, yeah. Yeah, you are. We're talking more about horses, but in this part that we're talking right now is you're so close to the Romanian border, and the railway right. can be kind of rehabilitated pretty quickly. It's not a huge problem. Okay. Yeah, because I mean that obviously that becomes a, a key factor later on, and I think what people are more aware of when it comes to to the fighting in the Soviet Union with the logistical issues, just because of the past distances and you know the difficult terrain that we're hearing about unfortunately yeah even though odessa, like, during the even though odessa is right over the border the romanians start having problems bringing up shells because the it turns into a two-month siege kind right. of nasty just two-month assault and like bridges get washed out and like yeah. they're using ox carts they you know they're having they're taking time to get the you know railroad railroads redone and they're just firing off tons and tons of shell um so like there are going to be logistical problems, but th during this period, it's it's not the it's not that big big an issue because we're 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 getting just into you know about a month of fighting right yeah. over the border basically. And that's usually when the problems start. <laughs> it's usually yeah. about a month. Problems start a little later. It's not that's not an uncommon thing in, in especially this time period. Uh, it's usually about a month and then everything kind of goes off the rails. <laughs> Fun, not intended. Uh, so I just want to ask one kind of quick question here, um, and maybe kind of setting up hopefully for a future show if you'll come back. <laughs> uh, that's okay is i mean it looms large it come came up in the chat a couple of times is stalingrad um you hear about that right from what's going on there is that this you can just if you can give us a quick answer is that sort of the same part of the same progression here right you talk about there's that post-war narrative of how they were supposed to going to stop and then they kind of got pushed forward a little bit is that sort of the same thing, or is it always kind of understand that they're just going to keep moving with the Germans as this goes on? Um, so with Stalingrad, like it's it, there, there has to be negotiation negotiations made, right? Um, but R Romania commits it's uh, July, uh, sorry January. So in mid January, Romania is already committing to providing because Romanian Fourth Army fights at Odessa, gets pretty hammered. Yep. Yeah. Um, finishes up in, in, in October, and then demobilizes most of that army. Some okay. of it stays. Some of it stays to occupy Transnistria. Right. A couple of divisions get sucked into fighting in Ukraine over the winter in uh, near Izium, where there was recently fighting. Yes. Um, and so Third Army is out there, and so like when the war doesn't end, you know the Romanian troops are out there, and you kind of have a. a, a and so, the, but the third army troops are kind of out there. Fourth army troops, most of them are back at home. And so, pretty quickly, on, early on, the Germans would come to the Romanians and say, "Hey, like we're planning, we're going to need another summer offensive." Mm -hmm. You know. And so, Antonescu once again to the end of the line, right? He he agrees right then. And so, a lot of once again, there's this idea that all oh, this is only Antonescu. That this was his decision, his war. Romanians right. by this point are demoralized and don't want to be part of any of this, but. I think if you look into the ideology and like the realities of, of what's going on is that most Romanians, you know, understand and still want to fight and still realize that this is a threat. Right. So they're, right. they're going to go off and, yeah. you know, in the summer there's, they kind of have these actually like when they start to, when these new divisions start going out to deploy to the Don Bend, they're having like um, kind of celebrations or like leaving kind of in high spirits. <laughs> you know, thinking that they're going to go out there and kind of this will be it. They'll finish off. You know, the Germans are having another big grand summer offensive and we didn't get it this year. We didn't do it in 41, but we'll do it in 42. Right. There's still yeah. that kind of hope. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, there's, there's a crisis in the winter, um, but the Germans overcome it. Yep. The Romanians do as well. It's right. they, they overcome that crisis. And in 42, it's not until 43 where after Stalingrad and especially after Kursk, yeah. that's like, okay, there's no more German summer offensives. No, nope. you know, now the thing, you know, the worm has turned, you know, like they're pretty much, yeah, they're on the back foot basically from there yeah. on out. Yeah. I mean, that uh, just makes sense given what you told us today is, is, is how that goes, right. It's not something they are forced into to do that way. They didn't have to do it that way. Like the Finland comparison 
excuse me, is is I think inevitable <laughs> uh, given what happens and and the way that those fronts develop. So yeah, that was great. So yeah, I'd love to have you back on talk about Stalingrad just because I think it's a another interesting one. If you'd be willing to do that in, in the in the future, that would be awesome. Yeah, sure. I'd love to talk about Stalingrad and the Romanian perspective and their contribution that usually is just getting rolled over and uh, doesn't yeah. get doesn't they don't usually get too much into what actually is going on and the context. I think there's a lot more to say there. Yeah, yeah. so that's uh, so what we kind of hope I hope to do with this channel is get those stories that don't get so much attention, get them get them in the spotlight, so to speak, to, to kind of cover these different ones. So other than that, thanks for that. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun. Questions were too tough on you. The viewers I enjoyed it. It wasn't too boring. No, no, not at all. I mean, it's just, um, like I said, I, uh, sometimes I get those shows where I'm just going to take it all in and it's going to kind of marinate and come back out after a while because that's just, there's a lot going on there and I need to look at some stuff after this. I have so many questions, but <laughs> I want to look them up in that way. You know what I mean? I want to want to do some digging and see what I find. Uh, but uh, yeah, so thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, there's some more stuff coming up on the channel. So just uh, keep your eyes and ears peeled for everything coming up. Um, Gonna be looking at some armored vehicles tomorrow, so that should be fun. Um, some stuff might be come flying at you. Uh, nothing planned yet, but stuff will be coming. So other than that, uh, thanks again. Thanks, Grant, for coming on, and uh, see you on the next one. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Bye.